SJ. Welcome to Muskogee Radio, your weekly source for tribal and community news, interesting guests and discussions, plus a local events calendar. Gary Five Jaho Jifkidas, Muskogee Radio Mabu Hedjinowedjikis. Welcome to our program this week, uh, and I hope that you will forgive me for being a little touch horse here. Weird weather does that to me for some reason, even though I wear a scarf and try to look pretty cool. Uh, we have uh, a couple of things to share uh, in our show uh, today. First of all, we'll be speaking with uh, Matthew Morgan, who is head of the Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association, about uh, the situation involving uh, the tribes, uh, Governor Kevin Stitt, and the uh, apparent impasse over the renewal of uh, gaming compacts, which uh, kind of keep things legal as far as uh, tribal gaming goes. And in our second segment, we'll be speaking with folks who are looking at a cultural preservation project that uh, will be focusing on uh, Indian churches, uh, Muskogee churches in particular. But uh, we uh, will be getting to that around halfway. But uh, first of all, let me uh, uh, get this segment going and we'll find out what's going on with the state. Good morning, Mr. Morgan. Are you with us, sir? Good morning. We, uh, I'm uh, telling our listeners I'm just a touch horse today, so I may have to force a force a comment or two. Uh, first of all, let me uh, get a quick capsule of uh, who you are and what your uh, mission is and the Oklahoma Indian Game Association. Sure. Uh, my name is Matthew Morgan. I serve as the chairman of the Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association. Uh, the OIGA supports tribal governmental gaming. Uh, here within the state of Oklahoma, we represent both the tribal governments and also uh, have associate members of uh, private businesses that participate through contracts or other support uh, efforts of tribal governmental gaming in the state. And so what we do is we provide education, we provide training, and we facilitate conversations. To, to highlight the great work of the tribal governmental gaming industry with, uh, within the tribal communities here in the state and, and the good it does uh, around, around the state. So that's kind of what, what we do here at uh, OIGA. Does the word lobbying fit in there somewhere? No, not really, because, you know, uh, we, we, we do not uh, work within the confines of the Capitol. We, we go to the Capitol and we're invited to update uh, legislators. Uh, or other elected officials uh, on particular issues, but we do not uh, uh, actively participate in any discussions where we are nonpartisan and we we do not actually go there and do anything that that would promote one bill or the other. Uh, when they have a proposed legislation, sometimes we get calls and say, you know, how does this affect your industry? And we we will give them that, or they'll ask for updates on what we're doing. And we always tr- uh, very inclusive and try to invite policymakers into whether it's uh, our general meetings or especially during our annual conference and trade show so they can learn more about our industry. How many tribes are uh, members? So uh, currently we we have uh, 28 members, but again, uh, our membership uh, renews January 1st. So, you know, depending on where people are at within their budgetary cycles, some tribes uh, pay differently depending on what their physical year runs. And so uh, we we usually run 28 to 30, 31 throughout the year uh, of of member tribes. And then we have uh, multiple, multiple uh, different associate members that that, uh, also qualify for membership through the OIGA. So you serve as a uh, a voice uh, for Native uh, tribal governments involved in gaming, but not necessarily the voice, right? Well, that's that's correct. You know, the 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 voices; those are the bosses; those are the tribal leaders; those are the people with the boots on the ground that actually, uh, you know, operate those facilities. That's that's who we try to work with, and we we try to to assist those in their in their efforts. But uh, but yeah, that's all we are. We we provide assistance, and we we try to provide, like I say, a voice to them, some education. Try to be a a, a source of information, and you know, and here lately, what we've been doing is we've been facilitating a lot of conversations to ensure that everybody is 
is well informed and and feels like they have a voice in this process. A lot of those conversations have uh, focused around the uh, the words compact and contract. <laughs> and uh, let's take a moment there, and perhaps you could uh, tell us what the difference is. Sure, that, that's not a problem. I mean, a lot of people you, you refer to contracts because contracts are what we deal with as individuals, or we deal with as one private business to another. We enter into contracts. Tribal governments enter into contracts when they're procuring services. So everybody understands the, the general meaning of the word a contract, a legal document. The import of the word compact denotes a government-to-government agreement between two sovereigns. It denotes something of more important than just a general contract. These these are governments uh, putting, memorializing some agreement to paper and and they're uh, to each other, and they're recognizing each other's sovereignty. And so you see compacts that we have with the state of Oklahoma through a variety of different subjects, just not gaming. But that's what they denote. They denote that governmental government element of those agreements are not merely contracts, but rise above that. Now, when uh, I hear your explanation and things, the, the what comes to my mind is it's uh, pretty much equivalent to the treaties. Uh, recognition between two forms of government. Uh, would you say that was accurate? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think at different times, you know, if it, if it was a different time and place, that's exactly what we'd have had in place. We'd have had a treaty. Uh, so I, I would agree with that assessment. All right. Now, getting back to uh, the phrase uh, compacts, uh, of course, we uh, passed a, a, a January 1 deadline when these things were supposed to uh, be resolved and uh, people get on with it. But uh, right now, the members of your organization and other tribal governments are butting heads with Governor uh, Kevin Stitt. He says the uh, compacts have to be renegotiated and uh, the tribal stance has always uh, has been uh, they renew automatically. Now, let's uh, take those terms here. Uh, first of all, um, uh, the fact that uh, the contention that uh, the tribes and the compacts just renew automatically. Now, could you uh, uh, focus on that for a second? Sure, we, we we can talk about that. So, so when we're we're talking about these terms, um, really, what we're talking about with within the the tribal state model compact, which was that's that's the base document that each tribe went in and signed. There's a particular paragraph and part in there, and we're really talking about part fifteen. B uh, of that document, and that's where the disagreement has, I guess, sprang forth. Uh, and uh, it is a, uh, it's an involved sentence. Don't don't, don't get me wrong. It, it is a, an involved sentence. But uh, if as as I've listened to people that were around the table and crafting those, what what stands out as important to us is is that the the uh, compact never just self. Uh, actualized and renewed on its own. What the uh, compact says in Part 15b is that the compact shall have a term which will expire on January 1, 2020, comma, and at that time, comma, if organizational licensees or others are authorized to conduct electronic gaming in any form, other than paramutual wagering on live horse racing pursuant to any governmental action of the state or court order following the effective date of this compact, the compact shall automatically renew for successive additional 15-year terms. So that's the first part of that paragraph that we're always talking about, that something had to trigger that automatic renewal. And we believe that the state met its burden to automatically trigger the automatic renewal through a variety of different things. Governor Stitt, on the other hand, believes that that sentence stops at the first comma, and it says it's automatically, it shall terminate on. Uh, We believe the second part of that sentence is of the utmost importance and believe the triggers have been met, and that's where the rub of this has came in, because under the terms of our compact, the rest of that paragraph goes on. It allows either party within 180 days of that January 1st date, to propose to renegotiate Parts 11E. Now, Parts 11A and E talk about 
the rates that we pay, and the exclusivity. So it allows the parties to come in and talk about those two subjects and try to figure out why this compact continues. Is there some adjustment there that both sides could agree upon? And we've always been very clear on our stance from tribal leaders' perspective of the compact is auto-renewed, and if that was acknowledged, that we would sit down and talk about rates and exclusivities per our compact. But that hasn't happened yet, and that's that's where the, we've we've always been in disagreement. The uh, conversation. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let please. me jump in that right now. Yeah. Anywhere dur- in that uh, language, is there any reference to uh, the compacts expiring or being required to be renewed? Uh, no, there, there's no requirement uh, of, of renewal. Uh, it, it was triggers that had to be met. There's also another provision within our compact that allows both parties to agree. Both parties agree to terminate the compact. There were a couple of other provisions that were put in that would allow the state to unilaterally uh, uh, stop stopped our compacts. But they all surrounded the tobacco compacts and whether tribes were in compliance with that tobacco compact when it was drafted, when it was submitted to tribes. But when that they, those provisions went up to the Secretary of the Interior for federal approval, they felt like those terms were outside the bounds of IGRA, and they struck those provisions. And, uh, and the agreement does allow you to severable any provisions that the, that the Secretary didn't agree upon. So those types of unilateral termination were taken out prior to this even starting by the federal government, which left us with either the parties unilaterally or, I'm sorry, both agreeing, mutually agreeing to, the, to, uh, to terminate the agreement or the state meeting some of those triggers in order for it to renew. If they did not meet those triggers, it would have expired on the 1st of January. All right. Now, let me um, drop back into uh, history here just a, a little bit. Um, now, th- uh, these compacts between the tribal governments and state governments are required to make uh, gaming, this this sort of gaming legal, right? Correct, under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Right. Now, that uh, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, law because it's, uh, it's required across the nation. It's not just here in Oklahoma. Whether it's uh, Lakota um, at uh, Prior Lake, Minnesota, making a fortune out there, or a smaller tribe somewhere else, uh, perhaps near the, the Kansas border here in Oklahoma. But uh, both, uh, all all. All such enterprises are required to have these these uh, agreements in place, correct? Correct. Correct. That is a federal statute that is applicable across the country in in terms of tribal governments being able to enter into uh, compacts in order to allow them to play Class Three type gamings. You have to have an agreement with the state government for no. Class three type games. Now, when we say class three, we're talking about dice and roulette and uh, things like that? Uh, correct. Uh, that that would be casino-style gaming. So we're, we're, we're talking about our, our slot machines that, that are electronic games. Uh, you're talking about uh, card games, roulette, craps, those type of games. Okay. Well, the... Uh Impasse uh, where uh, push comes to shove is, uh, of course, over uh, the renewal. And um, uh, I'm uh, curious about your your perspective on on what the what motivated Governor Stitt to uh, pursue this sort of thing. He was, uh, I believe, quoted in a couple of news sources as saying, "Other states, you know, kick in uh, tribes kick in more to." Uh, to the to, to their local uh, uh, state government and Oklahoma needs to step up to the plate and kick in even more. Uh, uh, first off, at the top of my head and I guess my heart is that you know is somebody getting a little greedy here? What's going on? And then uh, I thought, well, is the amount of money coming from those uh, tribal casinos in other states match what? Oklahoma tribes are doing those are a couple of uh, question marks in my mind so can can you address those two ideas sure so so on the first part dealing dealing with motivations I, I try not to get into what motivates other folks I don't find that as as useful I, I don't know why Governor Stitt chose this path I just know that we're dealing with the the outcome of, of his you know of him doing that and which was unfortunate both in terms of what he did and, and how he did it and and I will say I think tribal leaders always expected the state of Oklahoma to come back and say we'd like to renegotiate the rates that you pay, because when this 
compact was entered into in 2004, nobody was sure of, of exactly what the the ultimate benefit to tribes and to the state would be. In fact, you you see those early estimates kicked around of, of like uh, 70 million dollars that 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 the state estimated they thought that both the uh, lottery and tribal gaming would eventually bring in an annual basis to the state coffers. Uh, just just by way, uh, so your listeners understand, last year we almost brought in 150 million dollars from the tribes alone. So we've well exceeded those estimates. And that was the reason I think tribes expected the state to come back and say, hey, you know, we'd like to renegotiate some rates. Uh, and, and tribal leaders were prepared and continue to be prepared to have that conversation. Um, but, uh, you know, it, to your question on what is the impact, and that, that's what I think people really see. I mean, it's all great to talk about rates and, and all these this other things, but true impacts when you're looking at dollars coming in. Over the term of this compact, tribal governments have paid in exclusivity fees a little over $1.5 billion into the state coffers. Um, that's That's... In in return for the substantial exclusivity, Uh, and keep in mind that that tribes paid an initial $50,000 fee in order to allow the state to gear up under the compact for its oversight duties. Uh, And then annually, we pay in $35,000 oversight fee per tribe to the state. That's over a million dollars a year to allow them to not appropriate state tax dollars for for, – for performing their oversight duties under our compact. So we pay for those as tribes operate that. State doesn't pay. Taxpayers don't pay. Tribes pay that money. Um, But in terms of real dollars that come to the state, tribal gaming in Oklahoma is the third largest by revenue gaming jurisdiction in the United States. Nevada's first, California's second, Oklahoma's third. If we're talking about tribal gaming, California's first in overall terms of dollars it makes. Oklahoma's number two. Uh, and if you talk about it on a per capita, meaning if you look at our number of our citizens versus what Californians or Nevadans or any other state citizens receive per person, Oklahoma received the most money per person by the money generated through our exclusivity fees. Uh, and that's because, you know, we have so many tribes. We have a lot of operations. We're very small population state in terms, if you look at us in terms of other states. And so, you know, uh, in, in layman's term, we get a lot of bang for our buck here in, in, in Oklahoma from a state perspective of the dollars coming in, and they outlay no money in order to perform their oversight duties. So I think that's a really good deal. And that's something that we've, we've asked the state, you know, if you want to talk about rates, let's talk about that as well. And then you also need to talk about all the other things that tribal governments do in order to assist not only their citizens, but its local community partners as well in ensuring that everybody's lives are improved around them. Okay, let me come back to that in just a second. Uh, one more question on the, on the amount of bucks. Let's, let's just be, be real plain about it. Uh, the number, uh, uh, the amounts that Oklahoma tribes then uh, send to uh, our state government here, uh, Does that, you know, we're third, you say, but how close? I mean, is there somebody, uh, some uh, comparisons that have ever been made? uh, Like, does California send in $250 million? Yeah, I I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I would encourage you or your listeners to go to OIGA.org, where we have a lot of those numbers on our site. Uh, I did jot down some other numbers just in terms, because I I think that's really what people want to know is, you know, what what does it mean to me? How How does that help me out? So in 2008, in 15's last time, the OIGA did any type of surveying of its members to look at just what does gaming operations do. Uh, we paid out $105 billion in annual wages, salaries uh, uh, in 2015. I mean, that's real dollars going out to employees in rural Oklahoma that they can spend and, and turn over, $1.5. Uh, $320 million of employee benefits, so health care, dental, life insurance, retirement plans in 2015, 300, almost $320 million went into that. So it's good-paying jobs with benefits 
in the areas of, of our state that, that are not enjoying the economic uh, boom that maybe some of the more air, uh, urban areas have in this state in the past where tribes are, are serving as that economic drivers. And that means real dollars in people's pockets where they can stay in those areas, get a good job, and continue to live and work. And we're not having this flight out uh, fr- from these areas. And that, that's so important to the economy of, of not only tribal governments, but to, to the state of Oklahoma as well. Well, those benefits, then, uh, that's on top of the uh, uh, amounts that, that Buck's money, that uh, Doknawa, that, uh, uh, that the tribes pay to the state. So you've got that pot of money, and then you've got, you know, people going to work, right? Yeah, that that's exactly right. When we, uh, I don't know if you were, you looked at uh, saw the the Native Oklahoma Impact Study that was released just July, and I referenced that study because it's the most recent one that looked at the total impact of of tribal governments, just not gaming, but across the board, to everything tribal governments do. You know, um, in in terms of employment, and I'm going to use employment because you know we start talking about economic impact and, and indirect and direct impact, and it gets real fuzzy, and people don't 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 follow that as well sometimes. But what really drives it home for them is that tribal governments are responsible for almost 96,000 jobs in this state. 96,000 jobs. That that should speak volumes to folks that with but for tribes, without the tribes here in the state, those jobs would not be available. And those jobs are are done without any economic incentives from the state. You know, when you see these big private corporations move in, you, you see the state coming and, you know, rebating taxes. You see them giving land. You see them, you know, uh, uh, rebating, uh, you know, some, some other fees that help them with the cost of moving here and, and providing, whether it's 10, 20, 30, 100 jobs. They'll, they get economic incentives for that. Tribes don't. That's us doing things as good community partners. 96,000 jobs are, are, are responsible are, are here in Oklahoma because of the tribes, and that should speak volumes. All right, now let's shift uh, to the uh, uh, issues now that that we're facing. Uh, uh, Stitt has dug his heels in. Uh, The tribes uh, we saw in a press conference not too long ago, 30, over 30 of them banded together and said, no way, and uh, expressed their solidarity. So we've got uh, the two sides now that are just uh, being real uh, hard-edged about this situation. Um, the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation just, of course, joined a lawsuit against the governor. Um, in the time we've uh, been watching this, we've seen the uh, Oklahoma Attorney General pull out of this fight, say, no, no, maybe uh, I won't. You can go some other way. Uh, and even his secretary of uh, Native Liaison, uh, Lisa Billy, resigned and said, no, we told you this is a, not a good idea, but you did it anyway, and I can't work for you. Yeah. You know, bless her heart. Uh, now we've got, um, um, I guess, uh, a situation here where both sides have squared off. How would you describe what we've got now, and uh, where do we go? Sure. Um, so, you know, um, one of the outcomes of the past governor Stitt set us on was that tribal governments are very sensitive to the products in the in the in in because we're in the entertainment business in terms of our gaming industry and as as we we saw with the multiple press conference that governor Stitt had and he kept using this word uncertainty and so tribal government started receiving calls from patrons trying to understand this and getting nervous of whether they could continue to come to our facilities we had local and and regional vendors that we we do business with you know trying to call and getting nervous and saying, you know, what, I'm trying to understand this. Or is, it, is it going to be okay? Is it not going to be okay? It got to the point of the governor standing up there and using this term uncertainty that tribes had to move to protect their, their interest in this, in this matter. So instead of continuing to participate in this PR efforts back and forth through, through jockeying of, of press conferences, uh, Five tribes, and three initially filed it, two now have have asked to intervene, uh, decided to ask a federal court on a very narrow subject, and that is whether the compacts have renewed or not. And that is to make sure that, you know, this issue is settled once and for all by a court of jurisdiction. It doesn't go into rates discussion. It doesn't do anything beyond just asking whether or not the compacts have renewed 
under the terms of our of our agreement. Uh, once the court comes back with its decision, we should know one way or the other. Uh, you know, that question should be settled. And then if there's other th- things that we need to talk about, if there's other items between tribal governments and states in terms of, of our agreement, we can move on to those conversations in ways that everybody understands what the landscape is and there, there's no fear tactics being being thrown about. Our customers can continue to come and enjoy our, our facilities. Our, our vendors can be confident that you know we're going to continue to meet our obligations under our, our contracts with them as well, uh, and, and we can move on. So that's where we're currently at right now. The questions before the Western District of Oklahoma, the federal court, uh, they have that narrow question from them. The three tribes that filed that have uh, have briefed that and, and, and made that complaint. The state, the governor, in his official capacity, has replied and provided his answer, and so now it's we're we're on a a track with with the courts to uh, you know they'll set it through a scheduling order to figure out exactly you know what the uh, dates look like and when the judge thinks he can have all information. We don't foresee on the tribal side the need for for uh, a lot of discovery here because it's such a narrow question. It's very very much a question of law question of fact uh, that doesn't require a lot of discovery, and we we, th- we feel confident in our position that the judge is going to come back and, and confirm that the compact has indeed auto-renewed. Now, have you uh, got any indication as to when that uh, trial and decision may be coming down? No, I don't. I'm 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 like everybody else. We'll we'll wait after the judge uh, meets with both parties and, and writes that scheduling, and then we'll have a better sense of what that may look like. But we're we're all at the mercy of the court at this point. A couple of things have uh, been developing as as this uh, set of differences have, have have come to the surface. As uh, uh, United Tribes of Oklahoma, is that the correct name for that uh, particular group, have been funding some what appear to be some very expensive commercials with uh, some high-profile Oklahoma names in them, you know, like uh, football coaches and heads of uh, chambers of commerce and other notables like that. That's quite a, a heavy-duty campaign. Uh, now, is that something that your group has, has to deal with? or? Uh, do you see what they're doing? Agree? Disagree? What do you think? So uh, th- that campaign is called United for Oklahoma. Uh, UnitedforOklahoma.com is the website. Uh, OIJ does participate in that effort, uh, along with with other tribes. Uh, and I, I will tell you that the, the conversation came about actually a couple of years ago, where we've talked about more of, of a uh, global perspective on everything tribes do in this state. And so this idea had been in the works for a while to try, you know, I I, I don't know, maybe you're familiar, maybe your listeners are, of individual tribes that have done more public outreach to ensure that the general public understands everything that tribes do uh, in the local community through their partnerships or whether whether they just do it on their own. Because I, I, what we've heard a lot over the years is there's a great misunderstanding from the general public and what tribes do. They see projects or they hear of efforts and they know they get done, but they're not for sure how they got done. And so there was, there was this effort on, on undergoing for a couple of years of tribes trying to figure out how do we present that message in a way that highlights some of these benefits but doesn't come across as, as bragging about things. And mm-hmm. the uh, United I- for Oklahoma campaign was accelerated but because – uh, Governor Stitt came out uh, on July 8th with this op-ed with what we felt like was misinformation. And uh, and then, uh, you know, to, to ensure that that the correct information was out there and that we highlighted the efforts that tribes do across all these different facets. And so the people you see on those commercials, what, what took place was, was our group, asking our partners that we have long partnerships with on our efforts, would you be willing to go on camera and talk about that relationship? And that, that was the simple question. And all those people agreed, yes, I'd love to come on camera and talk about my individual story in, with with tribes and what, what we've seen come out of those partnerships. Right, and you've got so, some heavy hitters there. Yeah, we you know we got people all across the state because that's that's where tribes are located. We're located all across the state, and we participate in lots of different efforts. You know, uh, urban, rural, southwest, northwest, 
northeast, southwest, you know, uh, we, we participate in communities where we are and where our citizens live. And so we're very much ingrained throughout the communities of Oklahoma. Let me uh, ask you to speculate just a, just a little bit here now. Um, just in case the uh, decision goes against the tribe and say, well, we've got to got to renegotiate according to law and uh, uh, Governor Stitt's looking for more money. Let's, let's just make, make that one real plain. What uh, are your member tribes prepared to do? Would they uh, come back with another uh, legal weapon or would they just sit down and say, okay, how much more do you want? Uh, what do you think? Well, you know, I, I, I move at the direction of tribal leaders, so I'd, I'd hate to speculate and tell you where they're going, but what I can tell you is that throughout this process, tribal leaders have continued to meet. I, I know you referenced earlier in our conversation uh, the the meeting that took place at River Spirit where, where uh, there was a press conference, and there were 30, I think there were 32 tribes in the room that day uh, with, with a couple more being supportive but not able to be in attendance. Uh, but they've continued to meet through this process, and they continue to have discussions, and they continue to, to ask themselves these questions and work together to see, you know, what may be available to them, whatever the outcome of the case may be, uh, knowing that they feel very confident in what the outcome is going to be, but also realizing, you know, it's up to a court to decide that. And so I, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, what I can tell you is I think that, that tribal leaders are very reasonable partners. Uh, they understand the benefits that flow into their local, to their local citizens, impact the communities, and they become ingrained. I mean, we've lived here alongside and with Oklahoma for, for a long time. We, we understand that partnership, especially at the local level. Uh, I, I think you'd find very reasonable partners there of, of, of setting down and saying, okay, how can we continue to enjoy uh, this activity, uh, but also un- understanding what those market conditions may be. Because that's the other part when when Governor Stitt gets across renewal and wants to go straight to rates, I don't think he understands the market conditions that make up how you would come up with a fee that fits the market. Uh, he looks at rates through other states and just touts off the, the largest ones he sees. But you know, uh, markets matter. As as someone that county agree and someone that comes from a the Republican Party, I think that he should understand that more than most. Markets matter. We don't pay the same taxes in Oklahoma that other people mm. pay in the state. We don't pay the same amount for a gallon of gasoline because markets matter. And so, uh, you know, I think as long as people are reasonable about that, I, I think we can come to an agreement. The other part of that is is it's just not the governor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Morgan, we're going to have to wrap this up, but uh, okay. is there a, a final thought you'd like to leave with our listeners here? Sure. I, I, w- I would say this. You know, what we're having here, a disagreement with, with Governor Stitt, that does not reflect the rela- tribal state relationship that we have with, with all of our elected state officials in Oklahoma. We, we understand, we appreciate, and we're, we're glad to be a part of that conversation. And we'll continue to be a part of that conversation. We will work through this this issue uh, and know that, that you know, we, we look to, uh, as tribes, you know, being partners uh, with with the state, and we like to be partners with the state, but we will not be bullied into a position that hurts our economics, and and ultimately would hurt our programs and services to our citizens. Mm, very strong words, sir. Thank you much for uh, taking some time to talk with me. You know, we're going to be watching this issue for uh, for a while now, and uh, don't be too surprised if you get another call from me asking for some more of your time, sir. Of course. Thank you for reaching out. I appreciate you uh, being engaged in this conversation. All right. Uh, Matthew Morgan, who is uh, head of the uh, Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association. Um, We're going to take a short pause here, and then we'll be back and talk about some cultural preservation. So please stay with us here on Muskogee Radio. Hear that, hear that, hear that, hear that, hear that. That's the sound of hope being killed by meth. Methamphetamine use is causing huge problems in our community. Hear that? That's the sound of something you can do about it. Events like rodeo, res ball, and family time can help keep kids away from meth. Talk to your kids. Keep our culture alive. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Learn more at ncai.org. Who am I? Am I native? I don't want people assuming things because I'm Indian. I just want to be me. 
But how do I live in two worlds? Some guys just check out by doing meth. But that ain't for me. Because I see my family, my friends, my drum making, my future. There are a lot of cool things about being who I am. And meth isn't one of them. Learn more at NCAI.org. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Welcome back to Muskogee Radio here on uh, The Brew. Uh, Gary Fife, Jaho Jifkados. And joining us in the studio now are a couple of folks who are looking at preserving an important part of the Muskogee culture and history. We have, uh, uh, where are we here? Uh, whoops, my notes have disappeared. Um, Ann Edwards, who is uh, coordinating a project here, and Mr. M. in Spain from our NAGRA program. Uh, welcome, folks. We appreciate you making time for us and, and coming in today. Uh, now, um, we want to know what this project is. It sounds pretty intriguing. And you want to kind of give us an idea of what you're working on? Sure. First of all, thank you for having us on, uh, on the radio this morning. Um, appreciate the, the time that you're giving us. Um, what I am doing is, uh, along with my position at uh, Historic and Cultural Preservation, I am also a student at the College of the Muskogee Nation, and I'm working on my service learning project to um, complete that program over there. And so um, we have sat down and put together a, a survey, and we're wanting to gather more information on our historic um, churches in our uh, nation. And we realize that um, we have new churches that have come uh, into our nation. We have churches that have been here for a long time. And so we are wanting to gather more information on, on the history of the churches, um, and to document that, you know, for the posterity of our nation, um, we think it's important um, to document all sacred and cultural uh, sites. And um, Emin Spain is here with me today because he started this project when he first started working with um, the, the nation, and I think he said back in 2005. And um, so this is something I'm picking up where kind of where he left off and um, hoping to. Um, get this information out there, um, get as much information documented as we can in order to create sort of a mechanism to uh, recognizing our churches and to honoring our churches. You know, we want to um, celebrate with them when they make their milestones. And, um, you know, we've had a couple of that have already celebrated their 100th anniversary, and we like to be able to put something into place that you know um that honors and recognizes the churches okay mr spain uh, your name was mentioned at the beginning of uh, this this effort uh what kind of things are you focusing on what what uh, what are you what's your mission sir? uh I, when i first started here with the muskogee creek nation uh one of my first jobs was to go out and basically uh, collect information on cultural sites that are important to the muskogee people uh, for protection and preservation of sites such as uh, churches, ceremonial grounds, uh, cemeteries. Uh, one of our mandates in cultural preservation is to protect these sites. And so going out and documenting them, and I did a lot on the churches, went out and documented. I think there was 82 uh, old uh, historical Indian churches here yeah, in Muskogee 80, Nation. 82? I think I have a list of 82. Wow. Yes. And, and that... Uh, I know there's more, but they're they're more the newer churches that were probably formed here recent uh, mm -hmm. recently, mm -hmm. and probably mixed uh, congregations. Mm -hmm. The ones I document are basically the old uh, Indian churches, historical Indian churches uh, that still worship the way we used to. You mm -hmm. know, with the uh, camp houses and yeah, you know yeah. the language and uh, the system of you know it's separation of the sexes in, in the church mm -hmm. and, and those types of churches so um, and trying to find out which ones actually had their cemeteries so we could help protect those right we protect them from encroachment you know uh, whether it's livestock running free or uh, projects oil gas industry I know mm -hmm. it's impacted a lot of them uh, a lot of cemeteries that they weren't just wondering where right. were there uh, and Today, my, uh, my job is uh, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act coordinator. I work with NAGPRA to uh, 
basically protect our and rebury a lot of our ancestral remains in, in, in southeast and uh, maybe here if possible. But right now, NAGPRA is the uh, federal law that gives you the, the muscle and the teeth there to to go in and protect a site or uh, well it, uh, help um, develop it or whatever you choose. No, we don't. We don't develop the sites. It gives us the right to repatriate and rebury human remains that were excavated maybe mm. you know a long time ago by you know uh, archaeologists and right. you know projects where you know the burial may have to be removed or something mm. uh, it gives us the right to repatriate human remains uh, funerary objects uh, objects of cultural patrimony sacred objects and so uh, it's a process that we go through it's a federal process that, and sometimes it can be a lengthy process mm -hmm. but all federal agencies and anybody who uses federal money has to comply with these right. if, uh, right. or if they have a but if they have to have a federal permit. Right, right. Now, this, the discovery of something like that can actually stop a project in its tracks. If uh, somebody's been digging and uh, all of a sudden they come up with some bones or something like that, they have to stop and uh, alert the federal people in the tribe. Is that, is that kind of what it it, helps us? Yes, if it's on federal land. Right, federal, federal, federal land. managers or, or, or if they use federal money. And it's not only that. There, there's just hundreds of thousands of human remains that mm -hmm. are stored in uh, places of higher education, you know, colleges, universities, oh, that yeah. have anthropology departments and those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them are at police departments and federal institutions that, that uh, have basically gained them by arresting looters. And yeah. Especially in the southeast, there's a big problem with looters. People go out and dig up our ancestral graves. Mm -hmm. and. They don't care about the remains, they just scatter remains and things, which is sad, but all they're after is the pots and, right, and, and the artifacts. They go out and sell them. And yes, like that. big money on the black market, and you know, and, and it, it's a big problem in the South. It's not so much here, but uh, thank gosh. Yes, <laughs> and it could be, but you know, yeah, but yeah. you know, uh, anyway, that, that, that's my job. I, you know, I go through the uh, data, national database and look at uh, artifacts. I mean, uh, not artifacts, but look at the items that need to be repatriated, whether they're artifacts or, or human remains, and we pursue those. And as I said, it could be a lengthy process uh, to get those back for reburial. And what we do, we try to rebury them as close as possible back to where they came from. Yeah, yeah, Hickory Ground comes to mind in yes, Alabama. Yes. That's a different story. Yes. Uh, now, uh, tell me about the, the, the challenge here of, of uh, gaining this information on Indian churches. Uh, uh, you know, I, I presume there were some that uh, kind of came over on the Trail of Tears. And people maintained that, and then, as, as Emma said, uh, other churches kind of sprung up out of that. Yeah, I think that we're hoping to, uh, to learn more about that history um, by gathering this information, how long the church has been in the territory, if they came over, um, if some of the miss missionaries um, uh, came over on the Trail of Tears. Um, we want to document that. and. Um, make it uh, record. Um, it's important to document our history. You know, mm -hmm. they say that a nation that doesn't know its history then really has no future. And so, it's our job to um, document this history and to put it out there as um, information for everybody to learn and to have knowledge of. But our churches um, have long been an important part of our our mm -hmm. tribe, mm -hmm. um, and that's why we want to we want to document. Um, their existence, um, like we said, their milestones, um, whether they have cemeteries or not. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, the churches uh, have moved into more modern directions, so they don't participate in some of the more, um, I would say, um, older traditions that the mm -hmm. church would participate in, such as uh, maybe baptizing in a lake or a river or um, what the significance is of facing the east. Um, the east is a, is a direction that's important in both mm -hmm. ceremonial and um, church. And um, so we want to get everybody's opinions and what they were taught and document that. Now, when you um, contact a, a source, someone who's got this kind of information, what uh, kind of questions do you ask? What data 
so to speak, are you looking for there specifically? Well, we, we want to know all of their church information, of course, and, um, and their finding directions, how to get to the church. We want to see if we can get a list of the names of all their current deacons and women's leaders or, or any leadership position within the church. If they have a history of it, who was their first pastor? Mm, um, yeah. You know, those kinds of things. If they had... Um, an important government official or um, significant citizen that attended that church, you know, um, we want to document that. Mm -hmm. We want to know if they have pictures that they're willing to share that we can scan and make a copy of and, of course, return to them, but um, to document those pictures that they have as part of their history. We've also brought on board um, in our Historic and Cultural Preservation Department an oral historian. Uh, her name is Mitch Dillinger, and she's going to be working uh, with me on trying to document the oral history of the churches as well and um, the stories that, that they have that can be told and that we can document and pass down for, for future generations. Now, are you concentrating primarily on Muskogee churches? Uh, you don't Yes, we, we Inter are. Interdenominational kind of thing? Well, and that's kind of something that we're wanting to document, too, because some of our churches um, have gone interdenominational. Some mm -hmm. of our churches are now a um, mixed group. Not all Muskogee citizens, all all uh, races are welcome to come into those churches. Sure, you know, sure. We've had new churches come in um, to the nation that um, are more modern. Uh, we still have some of the traditional uh, churches. Um, who celebrate, you know, like the fourth Sunday. Um, we want to know what the significance of that is to the mm -hmm. church and, and how it began or how that history started with the celebration of fourth Sunday. Um, so, uh, how, let me ask you this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, how about some of the uh, kind of traditional um, protocol, if, if, you, if you will? Uh, where does that fit in? Now, I'm talking about, and of course, like the ringing of the bell. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get your first bell and then the second. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Separation of sexes, uh, mm -hmm. the placement of a bench, perhaps, mm -hmm. at, the t at the head of the congregation, you know, things like that. Yeah, those are all questions that we want to know what the, what has been taught over. You know, I can remember being a child, and uh, of course, the church my grandparents attended was Trenton down in Hannah. And... Uh, the bench was put out mm. at the time there was an invitation offered but back then i was so little like the preacher um the first preacher of that church that i remember was frank billy and he preached in complete muskogee language and all the hymns were sung mm. in the muskogee language and um although i didn't understand it was very meaningful it spoke to my heart and i grew up around that atmosphere and so we want to um, learn more about the significance of those traditions and how they've evolved over time. And, um, of course, the men did sit on one side and the mm -hmm. women sat on the other. And, you know, children usually sat to the back or, you know, they were in and out playing. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and My so, parents didn't let me do that. I mean, <laughs> it was always fidgeting. Yeah. Me. And um, and so in singing the Creek hymns, we want to we want to know about the baptisms. You know, if the church has a baptismal on site now, because some churches do, they have mm -hmm. you know become more modern, and and it's a good thing to see our churches growing like that. Um, but we just want to um, keep in mind what the traditions were, and to celebrate those traditions as well, and and to have something to in place to memorialize them as well. Okay, Mr. Spain, we've just uh, talked about some of the cultural practices that are still. Uh, very important to to Muskogee churches. Now, does uh, your program look into that? Uh, does it uh, blend in somehow and support or more active uh, participation? Uh, the neck below doesn't really. I mean, my area uh, doesn't really have anything to do with the churches or anything like that. It, it ba mainly, you know, as I said, cultural items and human remains mm -hmm. is the main focus on that. But I, I guess it could because we have a program here uh, at the uh, at the cultural preservation office where we have a crew that goes out, and that was part of their start. It was to go out and clean these cemeteries, but they're, it started by us trying to document all these important cultural sites, right. such as cemeteries. So, in doing that, we would go out and look at some of these cemeteries that were really bad shape. I mean, you know, they were you know, run down, I mean, you know, overgrown and things. So, and we would see people that would, Creek citizens would ask us, you know, what are you guys doing? And we would tell them, you know, they say, oh, we got a cemetery over here, a family cemetery, you know, come clean ours. Yeah. And 
So we got so we saw there was a need to do something, you know, to help give something back to the citizens. So we started a little pilot pro program. Uh, was using contract labor at that time. Go out and cleaning cemeteries at the same time we're documenting them. Uh, and we documenting them by using the uh, global positioning system, uh, GPS, and photographs and site sketches. And we tried to get all the information we can while we're out there at these sites. And and it was very helpful, you know, because a lot of them we probably never would have known where they oh, were gosh. at, yeah. you know. But, you know, in doing that, we were able to give back to, to the people, you know, by cleaning their cemeteries, mm -hmm. you know, and perhaps putting a fence around them if, if needed. Uh, but in putting a fence around it, you know, some of them never had fences or they were so old, the fences were gone and farmers or ranchers running cattle and horses and things out to their livestock. And we put a fence around them, but a lot of them would say, well, I remember it being bigger. There was probably burials over here. So we would come out with our ground penetrating radar. You know, we have a ground penetrating radar that we would come out um, do GPS in those areas mm -hmm. to try to find out if there are burials there because, you know, we put a fence, we want to include them within, you know, the cemetery. Now, when you say fence, you're talking about the whole cemetery or just yes. those little fences fence, around there? Fences okay. in the whole cemetery okay. to, to keep the cattle out from knocking over headstones sure. or, or that type of thing. Uh, Doing the things that cows do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh, we come out and, and with our ground pretty trading radar and say we can locate, you know, additional burials because we want to include them all in there. So that, that's that's kind of where that came from. And and I guess if there are some out there, you know, that they may, you know, the landowner, you know, may be so far away from the cemetery that the landowner says, no, that's not part of the cemetery or something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we have to, you know, use... Try, if it's federal land, we use NAGPRA, but if it's non-federal land, then we have to fall back on the state statutes, yeah. the Oklahoma state statutes, the ingress and egress law for people to go out and visit their family cemeteries mm -hmm. or uh, prevent people, you know, from basically tearing fences down. You know, there's laws against, you know, harm burial furniture or, or you know, and, and possessing human remains yeah. or artifacts. Yeah. So we fall back on uh, state law in a lot of places, mm -hmm. in a lot of instances. Yeah. It's amazing the effect that those kinds of things can have on you. Hmm. Um, here, 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 let me digress for a second. Um, when I was, uh, back in 78, I was a, a Ford fellow in educational journalism and then connected with National Public Radio, and they asked me to do a project on bones, Indian bones. And, uh, and I said, okay, I po poked around and uh, found the right people in the right departments and things like that. And they said, come on over, we'll show you what we got. And I was expecting, you know, a couple tables and trays, but I walked in there and there was this huge stack of drawers. Wow. And all of them were filled with bones and, and you know, you could, I don't know, it's the heck is good, but I, uh, the Jotty could certainly feel the energy there mm -hmm. when I opened them up. And uh, 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 I wanted to, you know, pray for them or whatever it was. I'm just a simple guy, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I just kind of wondered, you know, where does that sort of thing fit into keeping our uh, culture and traditions alive? I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Spain focuses on those things, but your project might not necessarily. But I, I get a, a, a feel for a religious aspect that transcends everything. Now, now, personally, do you all ever feel that kind of thing, or does it come into uh, uh, your heart, your mind, uh, your work? Well, for me, I um, I was raised both uh, in ceremonial grounds, mm. uh, around the ceremonial grounds, and raised at church. Mm. And um, I was always taught that Native Americans have always known that there's a spiritual realm. So whether you're going to the ceremonial grounds or attending church, they're both good ways. Mm -hmm. And I feel like our people, um, regardless of, of what they attend, they're sensitive people. We're always sensitive to these issues. You know, it matters to us because um, we value our human life. We value mm -hmm. our people. And I think all Native Americans um, value um, people when they're living and then the value that they left to us in death, you know, that their memory. Does that uh, energy enter into your work in, uh, in documenting these churches? Um, for me, when uh, my supervisor, uh, Raylan Butler, and I sat down and started talking about this, I did um, 
memories came flooding back in. My un- great uncle, Roly Haynes, uh, also pastored at Trenton, and um, I'm very sentimental when it comes to that church. Mm-hmm. My mom attended that church when she was little, and it was a school, so she attended school there. And um, so all of these memories come flooding back. Um, but I feel like I am sensitive to um, our people, to the tragedies that we've gone through, mm. um, to overcoming the tragedies, the historical trauma that we still try to overcome today. I, I feel a lot of that when I'm reading about a subject or mm-hmm. when I'm looking into certain things, if I have a memory that's triggered by something right. that I've read. Um, and, of course, a lot of times I can hear Emin and, and the other group of people talk about meetings that they've gone to where they didn't feel like maybe um, somebody who was representing at that meeting didn't respect our culture or maybe they didn't have enough knowledge of our culture and they Mm -hmm. misspoke. And I get passionate about those things because (laughs) I think, I mean, and sometimes it it becomes a heated passion and I try to back away and not say anything out of anger. Right, right. I know that feeling, believe me, when I saw the Smithsonian thing and these... uh, Workers are referring to this material mm-hmm. as specimens. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Rah, 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 yeah. These, these are spe- people. These yeah. are our people. You yeah. Know? I really wanted to bark at them when I could. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Spang, does this kind of uh, a spiritual feeling work into uh, the things that you do? I mean, you're right there next to our the remains yes. of our ancestors. Yes. Yes. Very. Very much so. I, as you said, you can feel it just being in there, and yeah. you know, respect we. Don't really, you know, we have my job. We have to view the remains and things, and, and quite possibly handle them a lot of times. And I know there's a lot of taboos with people saying, you know, we're not supposed to mess with these things. But you know, the alternative is our ancestors are going to sit on shelves, you know, forever, and and right. be, you know, scientific study, you know, uh, you know, used for scientific study and those types of things. But you know, it's it's sad that that we have to do this our, our people never expected us to have to do this you know have to uh you know go get our ancestors back from a museum basement or something and take them back and rebury them i mean that was just never ever thought of yeah. we don't have uh, any kind of ceremonies for it or anything like this and the non the people don't understand that they think we have ceremonies for everything and we have to explain that to them and, mm-hmm. and to them they view them as objects yeah, mm-hmm. such as you know Artifacts That's or something, yeah. yes. But you know, to us, you know, these were human beings right. that were buried by people that knew them and loved them, and knowing our culture, there was probably some kind of ceremony performed at that time. So the best we can do is repatriate them and rebury them as respectfully and as sensitively as we can. And personally, I, I always say a little prayer because you know I, I apologize for interrupting their journey, even though I didn't do it. But. It's, it's it's very it can get very emotional about it, but you know right. I try not to. But yeah. you know, like I said, a lot of people don't want to do this kind of work. But you know, somebody has to. You know, I mean, I want I don't want. You know, we see them as our grandparents. Mm-hmm. You know, as as our families. All right. Well, thank you so much. Now, um, we have uh, probably some people that maybe a caller right there is interested in. in uh, more information on these subjects now, um, uh, and uh, how would someone get a hold of you? And then, and okay, um, well, again, we work for the Historic and Cultural Preservation Department. We're located in the Education Building on the Tribal Complex, and you could reach um, our receptionist at 918-732-7773, and um, she can put you in touch with e- either myself or Emin. And we're reaching out to anybody who is involved with churches, um, Native American churches, uh, any churches with uh, with our Muscogee citizenship involved. Um, you can contact me directly at 918-732-7639, and we can set up a time to interview or do a phone interview. Okay, great. And Emin, if someone has a question for you, uh, what's the phone number? Uh, 918-732-7730. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming in. Uh, 
Yes, as I usually say, this looks like a subject we will be returning to at some point and find out the progress of your project. All right. 82 churches. Yeah. Huh? Okay. All right. Well, let me uh, share some community uh, announcements real quick and we'll be out of here. We have, of course, an Indian taco sale coming up on February 1st at the Ufala Indian Community Nutrition Center. Now, this is dine in only. So, eight bucks, you get a nice looking taco there. Uh, Glen Pool. Uh, uh, NASA and UT language programs are holding a stomp dance on February the 8th from 7 to 11 p.m. at 14901 South Warrior Road in Glenpool. There is a uh, craft tables and uh, vendor space. So for more information, 322-9500, uh, extension 568. Summer Youth Employment Program. Kids, you might want to go to work, and, uh, or you might not want to go to work, but uh, you don't get your paychecks for nothing. Well, I guess you do, but uh, sometimes uh, you have to work for them. You might want to apply now and get a hold of uh, the folks there at uh, the youth, uh, MCN Youth Works, 732-7773. Um, and, of course, uh, VITA tax program. It's that time of the year, so you want to get ready to pay your taxes. Okay, <coughs> Muskogean History Symposium, March 21st. 20th and 21st in Okmulgee at the Mound Building. You want to save the date? Uh, we're talking about much of our history, uh, things like uh, different tribal history, the Civil War, Trail of Tears, and other things, hosted by the uh, Historic and Cultural Preservation folks. 732-7733. Okay, that will wrap it up here for... Um, uh, Muskogee Radio this week. We appreciate you taking time, and uh, we're going to look at the museum in Oklahoma City, the one I used to call the museum that won't die. So uh, you all uh, catch us next week. This is Gary Fife saying, but oh, Mabu Hedge, it's good. You've been listening to Muskogee Radio. Join us again next week for more local, tribal, and community news and updates. Middle.